order for us to be in the condition we're in, ladies and gentlemen, we must believe God. We must take the lie for truth and the truth for lie. We literally have to be turned back. One of the great functions of media is to present lies as truth. You could not, as a minority in the world, speaking now of European minority, rule over the large majority of people except that you lie to them. Except that that large majority is kept in what we call a state of false consciousness. Because I got to tell you the truth, folks. I got to tell you the truth. So lies are at the very base of the system. You must get people to believe lies and accept lies. I got to tell you the truth, folks. I got to tell you the truth. And you must get them to accept the false reality. And the thing about it then is all of the institutions in the society that's built this way are going to be projected. Lies or half truths or truths that are, that are stated in a context that they have the effect of deception and maintaining those kinds of things. I got to tell you the truth, folks. I got to tell you the truth. Cause I gotta tell you the truth, folks. I gotta tell you the truth. Cause I gotta tell you the truth, folks. I gotta tell you the truth. Cause I gotta tell you the truth, folks. I gotta tell you the truth. Cause I gotta tell you the truth, folks. I gotta tell you the truth. Cause I gotta tell you the truth, folks. I gotta tell you the truth. Cause I gotta tell you the truth, folks. I gotta tell you the truth. Cause I gotta tell you the truth, folks. I gotta tell you the truth. Now, ladies and gentlemen of the listening audience, we're going to get right back down the pursuit of knowledge and truth. And let me say this, truth cannot be held hostage by socio-political demarcations. And what is equally true is that racialism is no respecter of truth. Racialism is frequently like a chameleon. It has the ability to transmute and enshroud itself as something that it is truly not. In today's lecture presentation, and from a uniracialist perspective, of course, we're going to examine that capability and phenomenon. Our lecture for today is ethnicity and nationality as racialism, the triad of pigmentation prejudice, which in most instances, ladies and gentlemen, is nothing more than an attempt by the vast majority of groups and nations to escape blackness by cloaking it behind geopolitical subdivisions or sets of exclusionary and unique social practices to distance themselves from the world's most transgressed group on a chromatic basis, the mythical black people. We're going to examine the sinister way in which racialism can masquerade itself through the notion of ethnicity and nationality. Now permit me, ladies and gentlemen, to set forth the objectives of this particular lecture. Firstly, to demonstrate that in many nations that disavow any racial distinction among its citizenry, such nations themselves have an inbuilt societal structure firmly rooted in pigmentation prejudice. Secondly, that the use of racial gradients, as the practice has come to be termed, predicated upon one's complexion, represents nothing more than the emulation and prosecution of the doctrine of white supremacy, even though, ladies and gentlemen, such persons themselves would never be construed as white anywhere a nation truly populated by the mythical white persons and governed by the doctrine of white supremacy exist. And in point of fact, such nations that have adopted the social structure of racial gradients constitute nothing more than nations governed by a color caste system. Thirdly, that racial gradients as a distinct social policy have their historical provenance in the founding of the doctrine of Aryanism and were particularly exported through European colonialism, slavery, and imperialism. And lastly, ladies and gentlemen, that adhesion to ethnicity and nationality is frequently nothing more than a political ploy utilized to divide the members of the human collective and inspires them to prejudice and socially degenerative behavior. 
Now, I humbly entreat your attention to both the meaning and context of some of the key terminology employed in this presentation. Now, by ethnicity, having uh, as its roots elements of the Greek term ethno, or if one prefers the Greek term ethnicus, depending on whether one is referring to the word ethno as in the term ethnology, or the term ethnic as in the term ethnicity. And so one has to speak quite reservedly respecting the term ethnicity and its semantical origin. But suffice it to say that both elements equate to the concept of a group, clan, or family contingent upon the historical era or the geopolitical rule of groups within the human collective. So when one speaks, ladies and gentlemen, of ethnicity, we are referring to groups of people identified by their adherence to a common set of narrowly circumscribed cultural, historical, biological, and political traits and beliefs, which as a rule, but not always, are within a definable geographical area, such as the Kurds, or the Zulus, or the Basque. But there are literally countless numbers of groups that could be termed ethnic groups, which makes Unirasis extremely suspect of this entire concept, and I'll be disclosing our rationale for that throughout this presentation, where it is indeed appropriate material to do so. Because we're going to find far too much conceptual overbreath, ambiguity, and contradiction endemic to this notion. And this is not the view singular to Unirasis, ladies and gentlemen. Michael Banton, in his contributing essay for the United Nations Educational, Cultural, and Scientific Organization, or UNESCO, titled Ethnic Groups and the Theory of Rational Choice, makes the observation in discussing the notion of ethnic and racial groups, and I quote, one of the main problems in the study of race relations centers upon the nature of the groups placed in racial and ethnic terms. This is in part a problem in general sociological theory where there are debates about whether groups are even to be seen as alignments and coalitions of individuals, or whether they have a nature of their own. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, are people being arbitrarily placed into these subgroups, or indeed, are they doing so of their own volition? And as Unirasialists, we are inclined to believe that it is the former. Now, this essay appeared in an anthology of essays from global sociological experts in the text Sociological Theories, Race and Colonialism, published in Paris, France, as early as 1980. And I believe the same criticism is germane yet today, ladies and gentlemen. Is it the true nature of people to gravitate to these ethnic and racial groups? Or rather, is it an inevitable consequence of forced societal bracketing predicated upon political power, parental upbringing, and individual insecurities? And nationality, of course refers to a given group of persons holding the status of citizens of a particular geographical area, recognized that law as sovereign and legitimately governed. The term racial gradients, ladies and gentlemen, refers to classifying persons within the practicing society by shades of color in a descending order of privilege down through deprivation from light to dark, or as it plays out under the multiracialist, from white to black. By pigmentation prejudice, we will be referring to the irrational behavioral tendency to either loathe or love skin color on the basis of varying levels of melanin in the blood, resulting from ideological orientation as opposed to any scientific veracity. And within a given society and the subsequent ordering of social privilege and deprivation on the basis of those melanonic levels. Now, melanin is a biochemical term, more specifically relating to the medical discipline of serology, or study of the blood, and it stands for a molecule within the blood that brings out dark features in people, inclusive of eyes, hair, and skin. And we know this to be true of all the so-called racial groups, ladies and gentlemen, isn't that right? I've seen many people classified as Caucasians who have brown eyes, brown hair, and who tan. I've seen the same, almost without exception, among the Asians. And we've seen it also, of course, among the apricot. So we know that every single group has levels of melanin. And some of these levels of melanin, ladies and gentlemen, are indistinguishable in either category that one may look under the multiracial caste system. Yet these people remain in separate racial brackets. It also prevents damage, that is melanin, from ultraviolet rays of the sun, such as certain cancers. 
So, to be the sole term mythical black person clearly has certain natural scientific value, does it not? This is a well-known fact that has been made articulate within respectable scientific quarters, ladies and gentlemen, as incontestable. And we refer to the appearance of these traits, most particularly in the skin, as pigmentation. And hence, we're going to peruse prejudice respecting same. And it exists on every continent in the world, ladies and gentlemen, with the sole exception of the Antarctic. So, we know that from this observation alone, that pigmentation prejudice is in consequence of socio-political behavior of the human race, which means through orientation, indoctrination, and preservation, as opposed to anything remotely related to a sign. So now I have just set forth for you both the semantical and conceptual framework within which we will be working during this lecture presentation. And before doing this, we're going to get a look, as I promised, ladies and gentlemen, at the history of pigmentation prejudice through the notion and development of Arianism. Firstly, ladies and gentlemen, and in an effort to avoid semantical confusion, when I speak of Arianism, A-R-Y-A-N-I-S-M, it should not be confused with the Arianism of the early Christian church of the then Eastern Roman Empire in the early 4th century and involving the priest of the Alexandrian school, Arius, which is spelled A-R-I-A-N-I-S-M. And I've simply taken the poetic license, as it were, to pronounce the beliefs in and history of the mythical Arian phonemically the same as Arianism. Now, why do I say the mythical Arians? Well, ladies and gentlemen, the term Arian derives from the ancient Sanskrit term, Arya, A-R-Y-A, which means of high rank or noble. And this poses an interesting question, ladies and gentlemen, to the uniracialist of quite a bit of significance. And you ask, well, what question is that? Well, if Arian means noble or of high rank, how did it all of a sudden become synonymous with white, you see? This is a complete cataclysis of the term from the semantic in its original language of Sanskrit. So here again is an example of how the racialists of old were even purloining virtuous terms and applying it to themselves. Because if the truth be known, Sanskrit is a hybrid language whose most ancient and profuse component is Vedic, the language of the Vedoids, a so termed black people who were the first to settle the Indus Valley from Ethiopia. They are also referred to as Proto-Australoids, or Southern Africans. Now, the Indus Valley civilization covers parts of Afghanistan, Baluchistan, Pakistan, and India, the last being called Sindh, S-I-N-D, as it was first called, and its oldest cultural complex being Harappan, and the two major cities, Harappan and Mohenjo-Daro. Now, Harappan, according to Wayne B. Chandler, an historian, author, and expert on early African presence in Central Asia, this culture ranges from six to 7,000 years before the birth of Christ, some 4.5 to 5.5 millennia before the evidence of the so-called Aryan people or invasions of any magnitude, and certainly before their conquest of the massive region, which is dated by historians at 1500 BC. So between the Ethiopians and later Dravidians, themselves a predominantly African people, mixed much less with Asian and lesser Caucasian stock, the highest of ancient culture, and according to Wallace A. Fairservice, Jr., professor of anthropology at Vassar College and author of the text Roots of Ancient India, published by the University of Chicago Press in 1975, and who has made expeditions to these areas under the auspices of the American Museum of Natural History many times. This includes the fact that the ancient script had already flourished for thousands of years. So how about that? But what is noteworthy here, ladies and gentlemen of the listening audience, is that from its very provenience, the term Aryan never had a thing to do with whiteness or any other color. And I'm not making the argument, incidentally, that the invaders were not of the Caucasian phenotype because it is clear that they were. What seems more logical to me is that those persons probably would have been partly Asian as well, but mixed with Nordic or Proto-Siberians as opposed to the Far Eastern Asian phenotype. 
What appears to have happened, uh, given the hymns of Book 9 of the Reg Vita, the sacred text of the mythical Aryans, is that the contrast of skin color was such a shocking factor to these warring factions that the historical writings dwell on it over and above the principal meaning of Aryan in Sanskrit, from which it is directly derived, that is, as noble people or of high rank and the importation of pigmentation prejudice and chromaticism into the meaning of Arianism was commenced. And racialistic scholars have preserved it, even unto this day, ladies and gentlemen. Otherwise, how does one reconcile the difference? This is precisely why we can say, as universalist, that the notion of an Aryan people is a myth. What their true names were may never be known, but probably of a totemic nature, or named after some tutelary, that is, protective deity, uh, would be my surmise. So as universalists, ladies and gentlemen of the listening audience, we want to be ever certain to decorticate the fabrications that are chaperoned into history by the multi-racialist. And the existence of the mythical Aryans as a human population group of millennia ago is but one of those historical fabrications. Yet respecting the oldest recorded incident of any detail and magnitude of pigmentation prejudice, it is of paramount importance and it lingers yet today in the nation of India. So this affords us an excellent opportunity to transition to the discussion of pigmentation prejudice in that country in Southern Asia of a billion inhabitants, which admits of no so-called races, ladies and gentlemen. All citizens are just so termed Indian or of one nationality it is maintained. India represents a society by multiracial standards of both intra, meaning within, Racial prejudice, given the fact that on the basis of the complexion, the nation should be classified as black, as much as Uganda, for instance. However, modern opportunistic racialists, principally from England, but practically everywhere now, have conveniently, and despite the conspicuous phenotypical evidence, as well as the historical evidence, betrayed their own nonsensical racial categories and sequestered them behind the guise of either, quote, Southern Asians or Indians, unquote. Now here again, ladies and gentlemen, and to the mind of the multiracialist at the top of the color pecking order, it's a question of saying, oh my goodness, never let them embrace their Africanness. Their history be damned, you see. Let's convince them that they are different. They're better than the Africans. They're not black. Heaven forbid. We'll just call them the Indians, you see. Well, how is it that they classify Adam Clayton Powell, or Colin Powell for that matter, black? I tell you, these racists will destroy anyone else's history and fabricate their own in either the name of the doctrine of white supremacy, or as I say, what is of equal abomination, the emulation of it. And its transparency, ladies and gentlemen, rivals that of a piece of cellophane paper. And as you know, racialists, I assure you, that we have no intention of letting this racialistic absurdity be swept under the mat. If the shoe fits, wear it. But you see, the racialists don't want you to love your totality. They want you to be humbled by some would-be racialistic skeleton in the closet or partial self-hatred. They can manipulate you better, even against your own fellow citizens, such as the hundreds of millions of Dalits or Harijans, meaning the children of God, as Mohandas K. Gandhi titled them. The term Dalit, from the Hebrew word, Dal, means broken, smashed, or crushed. And this is a term really of more recent vintage, meaning within the last half a century. It's a recent application, and so it really, all these names stand for the people who were originally called the untouchables, whose religious practice was animism, ladies and gentlemen. That's an African religion, indisputably. So, if there was no African presence in India, what are over 180 million people, and that is of 1947 when the British set up the scheduled caste, the title of the Indian Constitution, doing practicing a religion tens of millennia older than Hindu and endemic to the African continent? Because they're Africans, and because they had the courage not to forsake their religion for the wishes of the Hindu leaders or the colonialists, they were made untouchables and persecuted at the lowest and darkest rung of the ladder and viciously oppressed. Isn't that something? Now you speak of religious freedom. And we have this bit of history on the authority of none other than V.T. Rashika in his text titled Apartheid in India. 
published by the Dalit Sahayat Academy of Bangalore, India. And he is the author of over 20 books on racism in India and persecution of the Dalits in particular, the world's undisputed authority in this regard. Delop Duro, in his text, The Untouchables of India, published by the Minority Rights Group Limited in London in 1982. Of course, with the human rights organization breathing down the back of the Indian government from time to time, and I say from time to time because India is a country that uh, has a core of its citizen which is very well locked into the capitalist world, and therefore uh, the human rights organizations will from time to time wink at some of these major abuses of human rights of the Dalits. A few Dalits uh, have, in a token way, ascended into certain positions in India. But the vast majority of the class, ladies and gentlemen, remain oppressed. The largest number of unmixed Africans of the diaspora anywhere in the world, ladies and gentlemen. And this has been a heart-rending example to Uniracialists of how racism has cloaked itself behind nationality, as well as an example on the multiracial caste system of intra racial or racism within one's own grouping perpetrated by one's own. And as Uniracialists, we want our outrage to be known in every available quarter for the alleviation of the plight of the Dalits. And I'm confident that you'll want to join us in that regard.